just like we had with variable valve timing, we have several generations of variable valve lift. Variable valve lift systems use step changes and variable changes on the early systems. And, and one of the most widely used is what you see here in the shadow. Early system like Honda's VTEC changes valve timing and lift above a specified p speed. Later on, we're going to go into continuously variable valve timing, which opens up some new possibility for us. But in this system here, the PCM switches cam profiles between 5,600 and 6,000 RPM, where the engine power jumps by 20 horsepower. What they were trying to accomplish with the VTEC over 10 years ago was to increase the top-end performance of their fuel-efficient engine. Honda has produced more variable valve timing controlled engines than any other manufacturer. They put them in their motorcycles and in their vehicles. And they claim to have zero warranty claims on the VTEC system under warranty. They're going to use two cams instead of a variable system I've been looking at. It's going to go to an entirely new cam. During low speed operation, the valves run on the standard cam. Then above the magic number 5500, 6000 RPM, depending on the vehicle, it's going to switch to a high performance cam. Here is our high lift lobe on a cutaway of the engine, looking at it right here in this diagram. It only engages at the high revs. Here's what it looks like and the way it operates. During normal, normal driving, the blue low lift cam lobes engage the lifters. That doesn't mean the orange isn't running, but we're going to show you what happens here. During high revs, the PCM activates a solenoid that uses oil pressure to move a spring-loaded pin that locks the three lifters together. There's a pin right inside here that locks them together. The orange lobe will activate the cam when the pin locks the three together and the lifters are all locked together. So we still have the blue ones running, but they're already opened by the orange. We're running them off the center lobe instead of the two outside lobes. We have dual intake valves here. It's going to open both of them together and give us that big increase in horsepower. The orange lobe has a much higher lift and a longer duration, which is great for the high end. It's a perfect high end timing profile cam. Optimize for this high end operation of about 1800 RPM. When the revs are lower, the solenoid turns off the oil pressure and the return spring unlocks the three valve lifters. Very simple, very efficient. The net result is the engine provides good economy on the blue cam, but comes to life when the high revs, when the wild cam controls the valves. Many motorists who drive very sedately never know they have extra 20 horsepower available. The street tuners all know about this. What they usually do is attack the two blue profiles to make them a little more wild. Now, you can see all three cam lobes, the two small ones on the outside and the big ones. It is just like what you just saw. But now don't confuse Honda's CVVT system, continuously variable valve timing, also known as IVTEC with VTEC. Honda's IVTEC is variable valve timing with a phaser like was discussed in top valve timing. It's their economy engines that needed improved mid-range torque. But the VTEC name was so widely known at Honda, they chose IVTEC instead of VVT or CVVT. The VTEC system is extremely reliable. Low oil pressure can cause a failure to switch to high-performance cam, however. This is not a problem unless the engine has very high wear or develops an oil pump problem. The only problem we have seen is cam regrinding. Inexperienced cam regrinders have done a, made a problem. The two cams, the blue and the orange, must have the same base circle. The base circle is the round backside of the cam where the valve is closed. This is where the locking pin is going to come in and lock the valves together. The locking pin will not be aligned properly if these three valves don't have the exact same base circle on their backside. The three lifters will be in different positions. 
this is solved by knowledgeable people doing the tuning. Be aware if someone has done engine work and they complain about the power of their VTEC not being come alive, doesn't come alive anymore. This is the most likely area. This is the main area of complaint and the biggest area to diagnose. The bad news is you have to remove the valve cover to diagnose it or the customer has got to be honest enough to tell you he's had somebody work on the engine. It does not include continuous valve lift and timing, which is a disadvantage. This has been around for 10 years. It doesn't have everything the new vehicles have. That's not a problem. It's more expensive than valve phaser and does not give us the mid-range improvement where we like to have the motors feel the performance most of the time in their vehicles. Continuously variable valve timing and lift offers some more unique advantages. And these are big advantages. One of the advantages is eliminating the throttle plate. If we eliminate the throttle plate, we eliminate pumping losses. Let's talk about these losses and what we have here. Intake valve throttling, it's called. The throttle plate restricts intake air entering the manifold, creating a partial vacuum. We've all measured manifold vacuum before. Well, the engine must overcome this vacuum to pull mixture and air into the cylinder. This requires work. The work done to overcome the partial vacuum is called throttling losses. And throttling losses are a larger part of the internal friction losses of the engine than most technicians realized. We found a study. We took one page out of many hundreds of pages here talking about throttling losses from the advanced vehicle technology modeling the EPA is doing. Throttling losses in this document, according to Ross in his study in 1997, result in about 25% of the friction losses in the engine. Which means if we eliminate the throttle, we eliminate 25% of the friction losses inside the engine. This is power that has to be produced just to make the engine turn over that never gets used to uh, move the vehicle for its performance. This study was done in March 2004. The EPA number is in the upper right-hand corner if you want to go get that document. But we can control throttle in uh, various ways. We can control engine speed with intake air control, which is the throttle plate, or fuel control. But fuel control has got some really limited things because we need to control emission unless we have a direct injection, which we're going to cover later on with a separate program. Variable intake valve lift with total range of authority is necessary to eliminate the throttle plate in the intake, and we have those vehicles on the road. Variable valve-controlled throttling has very little manifold action because the intake is open with minimum restriction. And the first of those systems out there was the BMW's Valvetronic. Now, be careful. Valvetronic is BMW's. It works very much like Toyota's new Valvematic. Everybody's using the same words. Valvetronic is the first one that used valve control timing to control engine speed instead of a throttle plate to restrict the air. Now the Valtronic still has a throttle plate that is closed for engine start then completely opens when you're controlling engine speed. So if the engine is running we're going to have the valve open. When the engine is off the valve is closed. The throttle plate can be used for emergency idle control if needed for a limp in mode where you get a very limited idle limp in get back to, to where you're going. This is what we're going to be seeing. We have valve phasers like we studied in variable valve timing. It's going to use phasers to control timing just like we're used in the double Vano system. The valve lifting motor is used for controlling intake valve lift and we have total control. We have intake valve that can be, have the ability to vary lift from zero all the way up to 12 millimeters. Actually, it goes from 0 to about 10 or 11, but theoretically it's 0 to 12 or anything in between. 
Now, here's what the family of curves look like. They have the ability to vary from 0 to 11 or anything in between. Here is a family of what they look like at different spots. What you're looking at here, if you look at it, is the cam lobe. How much of the cam lobe are we riding on? Down at idle, we adjust it so we ride on very little of the cam lobe. Then as we go higher in speed and go toward cruise, it gets higher and higher till we get to the high end. Now let's talk about what each section of this is doing and what we're trying to accomplish with it. Short duration, low valve lift is limiting air intake to control idle speed. See the one down there marked idle? We're controlling idle. We're taking in less air. We're hurting volumet volumetric efficiency a little bit, but it gives us good idle, doesn't use a lot of fuel, and we don't have those 25% losses on the internal engine. Now, to get between 2 and 5, we get the best fuel economy during cruise. We don't have much power, but we've got better fuel economy. There's some reasons for this, and we're going to talk about it and use some numbers. The maximum power is developed when valve lift is over 8 millimeter. So high throttle positions, we're running 8 to 11 millimeters of valve lift. The 10 millimeters is kind of the average for standard valve lift on a fixed a cam. So as you see, we have total control. Everything has changed. Again, remember, we have manifold vacuum will be near zero. Since the throttle plate is open with the engine running, pump and losses are going to be minimized. Now, here are some of the advantages. We're going to talk about the disadvantages. Throttling or pumping losses are reduced when the intake is at atmospheric pressure. We get the improved performance of the entire operating range because we have reduced those losses on the intake. We have better fuel economy by optimizing the valve lift and timing, particularly in the mid-range, low-range end, and limiting the valve lift until we get to the high-performance side. The catalyst warm-up is improved by optimizing valve timing for cold startup to get high-temperature gases into that cylinder or into that catalyst earlier. The low valve lift function is used in the low to mid-range not only to improve fuel economy, but it also reduces hydrocarbon emissions. So we have this combination of things. The valve train has a large mass, and that limits the maximum revolutions. That is one of the main disadvantages. It's more expensive than Honda's VTEC. It's very much like the Nissan in their system, the variable valve lift, and control in their VVEL system. It's very much like what's going to be used in the Toyota Valvematic. So we're going to use the Nissan as an example. What you see here is a DC motor driving a control shaft that's going to change rocker arms. Let's see how all this works together. The electric motor has a screw shaft with a ball nut to vary the position of the control shaft. It's going to move it back and forth. This movement is going to give us a variation in valve lift, and we'll talk more about how we do that in a moment. You can see right here that we have a concentric cam that is rotated to vary the pivot point of the link riding on the rocker arm. If we vary the pivot point, we vary the amount of movement. The movement in link B down here, which is going to drive the valve lifters, is determined by the pivot point, which is varied by the position of the control shaft. And we have to keep track of the position of that control shaft. So this movement is measured by a position sensor. And you'll have scan data showing you the position. The end result is a continuously variable valve lift that covers the 0 millimeter to 1100 millimeter range. That's going to enable us to do a lot of things. The low valve lift in the 2 millimeter range is used for light loads and to control idle speed. The small intake opening causes the fuel droplets to vaporize into very small pieces or droplets. Now, this is really important. At this low range, low opening, the average droplet size is 9 micrometers for the fuel droplet. That all this small opening works well for light loads and idle, but larger loads is going to require higher opening. The 4 to 6 
is used for mid-range operation, and the 8 to 11 millimeters is used for heavy loads like acceleration. Now, when we get up to 8 millimeters, the average size of the fuel droplet is 157 micrometers. This is about the normal size for a conventional engine with fixed valve lift. The reason this is important is all of this is going into why all of this is necessary and where we get this improved emissions fuel economy. Six to ten percent improvement in fuel economy when we use a system like this. The Valvetronic operation of Valvematic uses electric motors like BMW and Nissan and it's going to vary continuously and eliminate the throttle plate. We are going to see more and more cars with no throttle plates. Now, when we talk about these systems, the testing of the cam phasers apply to the cam timing portion of the system. All of these systems also include this. The part of the Valtronic system that uses the double vanos is variable valve timing. Same thing with Nissan, same thing with Valmatic. The control that changes the lift has a separate set of OBD2 codes and it's got a position sensor. The actuator is electrical. It's a DC motor running in and out for lift control. Unlike the electro-hydraulic head duty cycle, we're going to go positive, we're going to go negative, we're going to drive it in, we're going to drive it out. It's a motor. The testing is seeing if the motor is getting drive in and out, moving in and out. We're adding the lift onto phasers, so a lot of the diagnostics we have are going to deal with the phasers. The lift codes are pretty straightforward. The intake valve lift control actuator has a circuit problem. It's not responding to voltage and current the way the PCM expects it. We got bank one, bank two, we got intake, we got exhaust. Most of the ones you're going to see are going to be focused on the intake. We have some other codes. P075 valve control actuator. All of these are circuit problems. It doesn't agree with the voltage, and there's a lot of them, a continuous number of these codes that have actuators. The voltage is low, the voltage is high. We have covered diagnostics of high and low like that already in our phaser control. The same testing applies here. Remember, we're just adding the phaser diagnostics to what we already had. Diagnose these codes just as we did with the phaser diagnostics. The voltage rules apply here because the codes deal with circuit problems. The valve lift portion uses a position sensor and has information for the desired and actual valve lift actuator. Did the motor move? The motor doesn't move. You're going to have to correct problems by going inside, removing the valve cover, and working on the motor and finding out what's gone wrong. So the diagnostics are actually much simpler. You diagnose valve timing with a phaser with all the diagnostic we used earlier. The motor either drives in and out and the position sensor moves or it doesn't. If it doesn't work, you're going to have to remove the valve cover to do any work on it and find out where the battery voltage is reaching it. Is the motor moving? Has it developed a problem? Is there a problem with the control arm? So diagnostics have not changed drastically. We've added one more piece that's fairly straightforward and easy to do.